Hi, I'm Gareth Rose from iPitch.com.au. In this interview, I sat down with James Suguru, the founder of the Australian startup MobiSeek. MobiSeek was one of the winners of the 2010 iPitch i10 Awards. And what's really interesting about James and MobiSeek is James is a sole founder, and over the course of particularly 2010, he really battled through the early stages of starting a business. He picked up some big name clients, and now the business is just starting to scale. Uh, very interesting, his interview. Well, James, thanks for sitting down with me. No problem, guys. Okay, so let's kick it off, um, I guess, with a bit of an overview about, about MobiSeek. Can you explain what, what MobiSeek does? Sure. MobiSeek is a, is a full-service mobile agency that focuses on getting available brands around Australia and onto permanent mobile sites that keeps the mobile channel open for them. And usually what we'll do is we'll work with a brand where we can tap into the online traffic that's coming from mobile browsers that would usually have an unoptimized experience and basically deliver them a mobile site. The, the follow-up to that is that we always ensure that they get ROI back out of the, the whole project or the whole, the whole strategy. Um, or a, or a why, depending on the, on the client, might come from browser requests, test drive requests, calls, download of apps, what, whatever it might be. But there's always a measurable outcome at the other end so that the client can see that the mobile channel is working for them. Okay. Uh, look, I mean, obviously, you know, we've chatted about it in depth before, so sure. I, I know the business fairly well. But to go into uh, it in a bit more detail, so um, I guess people listening and watching can understand it. Can you explain more about, I guess, what are the revenue streams of the business? Sure. So how does it actually, I guess, deliver value to customers and obviously how does it make money? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, I mean, the revenue streams are generally growing each, each quarter before we go and find new products and stuff to take to our clients. But initially it kicks off with, with consultancy fees, possibly from the very early days when we started. And then there's obviously creative and the build of the mobile sites. There's mobile advertising revenue, there's mobile search revenue. Some of the newer things we're seeing now that in recent months is um, mobile affiliates, where we've done a lot of study into that. There's M Commerce, which is starting to crop up in Australia now, um, and 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 even recently we're we're, we're about to, to launch a, an iPad interactive ad unit, which was something that kind of we hadn't looked at before. So there's a number of key revenue um, streams from, from the business. I suppose the the key ones really are the kind of the the build. The, the, the maintenance, the advertising, the search, and, and really kind of driving traffic as once we get up and running. Okay, so let me exp uh, try to explain this in my own terms just to make sure um, it's, it's clear for, I guess, myself and everyone sure. else. Um, a client might come to you or you approach a client and you know, it's an existing brand, a large, a large organisation, but they don't yet have a mobile presence. Correct. And quite likely they don't know much about mobile. Mm -hmm. So... You provide, I guess, expert knowledge into them about how, I guess, people search using the mo mobiles, yeah. and I guess how um, they can best, I guess, promote their, their brand and their services yeah. using mobile. Yeah. So that's the consultancy side. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you get a deal with them to actually go then build out a mobile site, yeah. that's when you get, I guess, all the development fees and the build fees. Absolutely. You go build out the mobile site mm -hmm. with them, and then after that, you continue to manage their mobile site yeah. in terms of. Um, I guess trackable uh, advertising, um, uh, advertising programs and things like that that they do, and you and you I guess have this trackable software that allows them to to, to you know maybe, maybe they're running or running some special promotion. Mm -hmm. It's through the mobile. You can all track it, see how it works, yeah, see where all the people are coming from. Yeah, and that's, and yeah, that's well, yeah. I think that's 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 roughly it. I mean, I think the idea is if you, if you almost compare it to a website. Yeah. Once we've got that permanent site built out. Yeah. The first thing we do is we redirect any mobile traffic that's hitting their website to that mobile site. Okay. So there's instantly some some traffic for nothing. Yeah. And um, we then basically would run a mobile advertising campaign across multiple ad networks where we would see which. Our networks get the better results, which time of day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We then encourage them to 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 do mobile search. Depending on the client, we might use mobile affiliates. But what we're basically doing is using kind of a plethora of of, 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 of tools to basically drive traffic to that mobile site okay. to ensure that they get the measurable outcome that they that they want out of that. Okay. Yeah. A, a brochure, a test drive for an automotive, a, a call for a telco, or. A, you know, an acquisition for, for a bank or, or a sporting company. 
Uh, okay, so so once you, you build their permanent site, obviously you're doing all this, I guess, ongoing work, which you may have termed maintenance or you, you may yep. have termed it something else, yep. but that is just recurring revenue that goes on. Absolutely. You might even redevelop their site further yep. down the track as you know, technology increases. And, yeah, and, absolutely. You know. And I mean, that tends to be, I think, in the case of all our clients, we'd have a phase one, a phase two, a phase three, because obviously, the, you know, as, as technology advances, there's more things we can do. Okay, good. That, that's very clear. Um, look, before we get on and talk about in, in depth about the, the business, um, let, let's talk, I guess, a little bit about um, yourself as a sole founder. Sure. So, at the moment, I mean, there's a lot of talk about starting up a yeah. business with a co-founder and the yeah. benefits of that. Um, sure. You obviously didn't, and yeah. you know, you, you did it yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of challenges, I guess, involved with being a sole founder. Can you yeah. can you talk more about them? Yeah, I can. I mean, I mean, I think at the very start, the first thing you've got to do is is put a sale on the board of some description. So I think the first six to six to nine months was really knocking on doors, and um, without much credibility under the under the new brand, having had some under the previous company I worked for. So the first six months, really, the focus is just about getting um, clients on board and getting uh, what we were looking for was big brands on board. So it was it was challenging at the best of times. Um, it's a roller coaster ride. You 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 often think, am I doing the right thing, or should I go back to it? Uh, you know, a paid salary job. And um, you uh, have have not, you know, you know, you may have been encouraged by some people. You may have not been encouraged by other people. So you've constantly got some doubts in your head about whether you're doing the right thing. If that makes sense. And um, so, in, in terms of a, a workload's perspective, initially it's just selling, 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 knocking on doors, having a hundred coffees, speaking to as many people as you possibly can to get that first kill. Yeah. From an emotional perspective, it's a roller coaster. You've got to just kind of believe in yourself, believe that you're you're, you're doing the right thing, and um, so that you you can get that that kind of first deal out. So it's um yeah I don't think there's any books that have been written on guiding people through that. Certainly the first six to, to nine months. You know? did, did you find that even after I mean you got your first sale, which, how, how many months in was that by the way? And it was it was probably about six months after incorporation of the business. Yep. But I had. I had incorporated the business and then I went on to the mega program which I found out after incorporating the business which ran from July to November 2009. So I didn't really start selling until the end, towards the end of that course and we had a first deal in January 2010. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah it does. I mean that was going to be my, um, I guess one of my questions shortly about I guess the background and how the business actually started. Yeah. So let, let's just continue on that sure. there for a moment. Yeah. So just, just moving back a little bit though, yeah. prior to that you were already working in a mobile company, was that That's right? correct, yes. Can you, can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I arrived in Australia in 2003. There was a mobile company that had an existing um, company in England, but they were looking to set up in Australia. So I joined that company as their first employee with one of the directors who had come out to set it up. Um, it was back at I think it was probably 2004. Um, it was really more about mobile response, texting one three numbers. We had, we we kind of um, pioneered that space in terms of getting major brands to to spend marketing dollar, dollars in mobile on a sta- on a standard rate rate number. So the idea was um, you could text for a brochure to a one three number and get the information you required. So, but I think what that did for me was, and I might not have realised it at the time, was. In the subconscious, what I was actually learning, apart from the mobile kind of side of things, was also how to take a business from two people to kind of up to 15, 16, 17 people, which is, which is what we did. How to get big brands on board in, in the mobile space, um, and which can be quite challenging, and certainly was more challenging back then than it is now. And we worked in, across New Zealand and Asia and, 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 and so on, so there was trips up there, which were obviously we learned a lot in terms of the different things so I got a good foundation in a, in a kind of a startup business even though I was on a salary um, and, and, and also a good foundation in mobile if that makes sense uh, yeah, yeah yes it does so um, what, was, what was actually the driver of the decision to leave I guess that company and then go out on your own and um, I, th- I think um, I, I, I was always very focused I've always been in, in, on the new business development side but I was always very focused on the data as well so what was the data telling us? How many brochures did we get for that car company when we went on TV that night? 
how, you know, how are the results looking, etc., etc. So for me, um, when we started building out mobile sites for, client, for, for brands, I, I could see that we were getting a lot more activity once we put a mobile site in, in an environment where there was people on 3G phones. So back then it might have been on um, an operator portal or on um, somewhere where, the, where there were people actually on 3G phones in, in 2006, six seven. So my whole thinking was that this is where the space was going to go. And, um, and, and, and I really wanted to do something in that space, whereas the business that I came from was more a mobile response focused business. Yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's how, I, how I basically moved and kind of went into the, into the more the, the overall kind of mobile strategy of, of driving consumers to a mobile destination. Okay, um, great. So in terms of, I guess, then, I mean, your background, which you described, and um, where I'm going with this is your skill set, it's, right, it's largely around sales, business development, with that, uh, I guess, knowledge and, and interest in the uh, monitoring the data. Is Absolutely, that, yeah? correct. Yeah. Okay, so, so where I'm going with this is, in your current site, um, how did, obviously, you, you go out and build the, the technology for your clients, so in your current business... Yeah. Um, you obviously go and build the technology for your clients. Yeah. Um, how does the technical side of the business work? If okay. you're not technical yourself. Sure. Well, what we do in terms of the mobile site builds, what we do is we use best and breed partners. And when I say best and breed partners, it's not a term I use loosely. When I started the business, I went out and I researched the majority of, of mobile site developers in, in Australia, certainly the, the top ones. And, um, and I aligned myself with what I believed was, was the more premium of, of those guys. So, um, for example, the majority of our sites have been built by Tiger Spike in Surrey Hills. And we also use a, a Melbourne company called Visual Identity, who are a fantastic interactive company. We've, um, we, we, we've done some work with Mo Generation, Keith Ahern there. So, so what we do is we basically we outsource the building of the actual sites what we keep in house is the tracking and, and the platform to be actually to able to monitor the driving of the traffic to those sites and monitor not just where is that traffic coming from, but when we when we when we can see where the traffic's coming from, which pieces of those inventory are actually driving the, the action, be that a call or a browser request or a test drive or a download or whatever it might be. So that's the bit we focus on. Whereas the actual build of the actual um, of, of the destination, we would outsource. Okay. In terms of, I guess, that core uh, tra- trackable software that, that's in uh, still yeah. internal. Yeah. Um, you, you, I gather you, I mean, you have to get that outsourced yeah, in that terms was, of the actual build sure. when you first did it. Absolutely. Did you, I guess, project manage and spec yeah, that I, yourself? Yeah, I, I did project. I did project manage that when it came to the specs and some of the terminology. It was kind of I I, I, I worked with um, my advisor Roger Roger Kermad. Um, who's been involved in the business from, from the start. So I kind of explained what I wanted it to, to look like and then we kind of worked together to get that um, built out. Does that make sense? So I, I, I might not have known exactly yeah. how to actually write that technical brief, yeah. but um, there was a, a number of things happened for us to kind of get it. Okay, let's, let's go down the track of the advisor because I was going to ask it earlier and we went down another, another topic. Yeah. Um, obviously, being, being a sole founder, you know, we talked about the challenges and the, yeah. and the ups and downs. Um, can you explain more about, I guess, the role of, of Roger and, I guess, sure. the advisor helping you, um, I guess, both um, both with the business in terms of, yeah. you know, emotionally and advising and all that sort of stuff, but as sure. well as, you know, technically, which is what you mentioned there. Yeah. I think, um, well, Roger, I met through the Mega program. He was a mentor on that program. And um, basically, if, if I could explain the advantages of having an advisor, um, you get a very objective view on things. So I'm obviously there kind of going ahead, you know, wondering if this is something that's going to actually happen at the other end or if it's, you know, that, that whole roller coaster journey. Rogers obviously um, works on a number of different projects and um, was able to give me a very objective viewpoint on things. So um, if I was down in an emotional space where it was like, this isn't working or this is working too well, I could use him as a kind of a, a buffer and, and kind of get some real feedback back from, from an objective space. I think that was one of the most um, important things, certainly throughout that first nine, nine to 12 months. And the other thing as well is that you can often find your situation, yourself in situations, I suppose, where maybe somebody's trying to, 
to get you involved in something and it was always great to kind of say well unfortunately I can't I can't give you an answer on that until I speak to to an advisor if, if that makes sense yeah, so it, was, it was an outlet like that um, and then I think just from from just a technical point of view I mean um, Roger's experience kind of speaks for itself but having someone to the side of you that you could get advice on a technical basis when needed was very very important so, so I, I guess I'm curious about that because I mean you'd already incorporated the business mm-hmm. uh, prior to Mega, Correct. prior to being right yeah. So yeah. Um, maybe it's sort of irrelevant here, no. but, but, I, but I'm I'm curious to know if you're not technical yeah. um, and you didn't have the support of, of yeah. Roger and someone who can sure. I guess, uh, work with you on a more yeah. more technical na- basis. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any view on how you would manage a technical project? Because that's yeah. something that comes up with a lot of startups where sure. the founders aren't that technical, they're business people yeah. and they're trying to get tech projects you know, built basically. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how you do I, 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 I do and I mean I kind of maybe I put myself down a little bit too much in, in the tech. I mean back in, in the previous company we, I would still manage technical jobs. We would still get mobile sites out from the developers to kind of live, live stage. But it was really more for um, more in-depth technical uh, knowledge where, where I'd be very, very weak. Um, I have no doubt that without the advisor, I certainly wouldn't be as, as far down the road as I am. Well, without doubt, yeah, I, I think I think that would be fair to say. Okay, and, and what about um, engaging actually this the technical service provider? I think you said it was a tiger spike or something well, that's, like that. Yeah, yeah. What about that, I guess, that relationship and that communication? Sure. Where's the cutoff in terms of, I mean, you get the client, you bring them in, yeah. and obviously you sell them the, the broad solution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you then introduce uh, type no, in, 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 in this instance, software? we have a really, really good relationship. Um, Moby Seek and Tiger Spike have a very good relationship. Oh. So, w- in, in that instance, what we'll do is we basically usually deal with the client all, all the way through, and then we work with Tiger Spike to kind of try if the client changes their mind at the last minute, or if changes are updated, or whatever needs to be done. We do take the management of that back to, to Tiger Spike in order to, to affect those changes. Okay, so, so the t- uh, Tiger Spike never actually directly yields with the client. They, they have done in, in some cases, they have done. Um, in, in some cases, uh, what, I suppose what MobyC tries to do for that client is to take as much of, of, of the work away from them. Okay, So we'll basically say to the client, what, what is it you want? And then we'll add our kind of expertise on it and then we'll take it to Tiger Spike. We'll then build it out and we'll take it back to the client and if they want changes, we'll take it back. But the idea is to try and give that client who's making a big decision to, to open the mobile channel and to build out a permanent mobile presence. We want to make that as seamless as possible. Yeah. And that's why that relationship between MobiSeq and TigerSpot is so important. Okay, you yeah, got it, yeah, great. Um, okay, so so how, how then do you acquire big name customers like me, sure. Vodafone, Renault, yeah. and yeah. some of the other ones you've got? Sure. Um, um, I mean, this has been something that's, um, I think, Again, we've learned through the previous previous business. The, the bottom line is it always usually kicks off with a cold call to a marketing director. And that's, that's, that's the way we go. We have had experiences before of trying to work it through the bigger agencies. And, um, and it, there's too many obstacles there to actually get a result out at the other end. The, the usual process is a cold call to a marketing director. The marketing director may say, um, you'll need to speak to one of my big agencies or whatever it might be. And we will we'll, we'll challenge the marketing director and we will talk about some of the insights that we have and, and, and how we specialise in mobile, hopefully to get to a point that we get 45 minutes with that marketing director where we make a presentation. And I think then what we try and highlight is what MobyC can bring to that brand that perhaps the bigger agencies who haven't spent as much time in the mobile space may not be able to, to, to bring Oh, okay, um, but I mean that makes a lot of sense. It it, it sounds pretty straightforward from a, a business to business sale. Yeah. Um, it's so, not straightforward. Uh, is it? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm simplifying, but in terms yeah, yeah, of the yeah. cold call, you meet them, you present. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's challenging because you you it, it, it is it is outside the rule book. I think a lot of it, a lot of um, a lot of businesses, certainly in the space we're in, what they do is they tend to sell to the agencies. The agency then takes that and sells it to the client. Okay. That's the rule book would, would dictate is usually the way things happen. We break that rule. 
and we go kind of over the top and we speak to the marketing director or the marketing team or the digital director or whoever it might be. Um, and the reason we do that is because the experience we've had throughout the course of seven or eight years of mobile has always led us to believe that that is the quickest way to get that brand to open the mobile channel. Oh, okay. Um, does that make sense? It, it, yeah. it does. And, and um, I'm, I guess I'm not aware of in terms of how sure. the industry normally works. Yeah. Um, I guess I was more referring to if anyone's got a business to business product and they're trying to contact, it's a cold call, they get that meeting and, yeah. and that, I could see how that works and mm -hmm. that's all I was sort of trying to simplify. Sure, sorry, yeah, um, yeah. The, the, I'm curious that as a startup, yeah. you, you meet this, imagine the first meeting, and yeah. you didn't even have a reference point. Sure. Yeah. You go in there, had, I mean, you had X amount of years of experience yeah. in that mm -hmm. space, yeah. but in terms of the company, you're a startup, you don't really yeah. have credibility. Sure. In that 45 minute presentation, yeah. how do you convey your credibility? Yeah, I think I think it's, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, if I, I remember back to those days, I mean, we had I had a deck that I kind of completely did again and again and again. What 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 I basically brought to those early meetings was a, a strategic presentation that said, "Look, this is where you are now. You have no mobile presence, right? You have four or five percent of your web traffic, and when they go to your website, this is what it looks like. It's a terrible experience." If you were to employ MobiSeek and follow the strategy, A, B, C, D, E, F, are, are how we'd open the mobile channel and the benefits that you would get from it. So it was, you're right, it was very, very difficult to certainly get the first couple of wins, but, um, but, but it was, we had a very, very strategic presentation at the time, or certainly I did, that kind of, I think, obviously got the fires burning in, in some clients that said, you know what, this guy's right, and, 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 we, and we need to kind of follow this strategy, you know? Uh, okay, so, I mean, the, the problem was big enough and they could say, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. I gather the first one that, that went ahead with it was like, yeah. well, let's just take this pump. They, they seem like yeah. they're legit. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's just do it. It was, it, yeah. it was basically that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was. And, and I think, um, and the first, the, and, and, and to be honest, the first, the first brand we worked with, Mini Australia, I know we were in a competitive pitch at, at the time. Um, I, I remember it very clearly actually because you can imagine working that, that much to kind of get a brand that close. Um, but we were asked why do you think your strategy is different to other strategies? We weren't given the other strategy but we put the points forward as to why we thought it was unique and I think that's basically what got us out of the line there in that instance. Okay, great. So um, just, just following this through in terms of the rest of the sales process, you go there, you have the meeting, Obviously, you get some interest. Um, you know, they might come, they might they probably did ask you back for further meeting. And you pitch the more detail and you explain it and you know, the whole solution and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the rest of the sales process normally uh, normally yeah. plays out? Once once things. Oh, I, guess, I mean, yeah. So basically, you've got that forty five minute, uh, minute yeah. meeting or sure. an hour long meeting or whatever. Yeah. What are the next steps from from that point there right to a I guess a custom acquisition and. Building and that sort of stuff. It depends on the vertical. I mean, the client may go do their own research. They may go and um, ask other providers to come back with uh, their own mobile strategy or what they should do in the space. In many cases, they have to because they have agencies on retainers who, who um, I suppose, have to put they have to they have to do the right thing and put it forward. Um, but I suppose what the, the really the next step that we 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 push for really is to get signed. Um, there is not a lot we can do from that point on. Um, once we've kind of presented, we've put a proposal forward, then really it's 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 to get signed off. A lot of it is out of our hands then at that stage. If that, if that makes sense. Is the is the sign off for the the first build or is the sign off for some initial consulting? Um, I, I know in my own experience in in a similar sales environment, it's often easier to sell. Sure. I don't know two or three grand worth of consulting. You get yeah. in there, you discuss yeah. their requirements yeah, yeah, and yeah. detail, and then you go yeah. them the We've always, I, I, I totally take your point. I think um, the majority of the cases has been for the whole strategy okay. to to open that channel up. That's been the kind of the, the what's been put in front of them. Let's yeah. open this channel up. Let's build you a permanent site. Let's take the traffic that's having an unoptimized experience in your web, drive it to the site. Let's spend some money on mobile advertising. Let's spend some money on mobile search, and let's really do this properly if we're going to do it. So, I mean, there has been instances of clients, like you said, Gareth, where you, you take a few, um, few weeks of consultancy to come in and maybe 
you know, work on, on where you think they should go. But usually what Moby Seek will, will do is just say, listen, you know, you've got you've now got ten percent of your web traffic are, are, are coming from mobile devices. You need a full blast strategy to fix this problem. Okay, cool. Um, marketing fit for your business for Moby Seek. Sure. Um, we've talked a lot about sales and cold calling and yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, obviously in terms of how marketing fits with sales, do you normally know, market it? There's the awareness and then it turns into sales. Yeah. Do you do much marketing or is it more mainly selling in your business? Um, I haven't, we haven't done a lot of, I, if, if, if you look at it from when we really kind of became commercial, so we've been commercial for about maybe 15 months, so, you know, January 2010 until now. Um, the website was built by a friend of mine back in July 2009. Um, we, the focus really for, for, for me has been to bring on global brands, right? There hasn't been any kind of um, online marketing or anything like that. What we have done is we've done a lot of networking, attended a lot of industry events, and um, even when we had a kind of a story to go to market, I remember bringing around a few PR companies to see if we could get something released, and we wanted all sorts of retainers. So in the end, we picked up the phone to a, to a journalist in the broadsheet and said, "Listen, I have a story for you. Can I come and talk to you?" And, and went and went straight to the journalist to kind of tell the story which got written on one of the broadsheets. So it was very much kind of the focus being on getting these global brands on board as clients. Um, and and I, think, I think now that we've got some very, very good case studies to kind of put to market, I think certainly over the course of the next two or three months we will launch a new website and we possibly will rebrand and, and we'll get those case studies up there which are very, very interesting. Um, but certainly for the, for the first 15 months the focus had to be on getting those global brands on board. That's simply where we really put all the focus. Uh, okay, and, and I believe that does make sense to me. I'm just trying to clarify it is, um, imagine if you were marketing in the early days, sure. they come to your website, yeah. there's nothing there, yeah, they're yeah, blind yeah. case studies, yeah, 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 and they're yeah. probably not going to stay. Whereas yeah. your thinking is... We got a website, there was always a website up there. But, but there's not, I mean, case. it's... Yeah, there's not case study, there's no, no, case no, there's no you, know, you can't say this is our portfolio Absolutely. or anything like that. Whereas yeah. now if you do if you do, do marketing, yeah. people come to your website and say, oh, they've got Mini, they've got you know, yeah. Vodafone, yeah, they've yeah. got you know, these guys, Absolutely. oh, we should talk to them. I yeah. agree, I, I, I agree with you. I think as well, what you have to remember is because I've worked for a mobile business before for five, six years, I knew the value of, of that type of business having a, a you say, say a 40 grand website was never really going to drive a lot of business. Because you're talking about a new channel and you're talking about mobile strategy, it's something that you've got to get up and actually sell on. Um, I'm sure there will, there will become a point when we relaunch our website that, that people will hit the website and request meetings and so on and so forth. But I think that certainly over the last 18 months, the reason why I was never concerned about it was because I knew that the focus had to be on get out there speak to the brands and get the brands on board. Yeah, Does that make yeah, sense? yeah for sure. Um, cool. Okay, so, so coming back to the start, um, obviously you, you incorporated, you, you went on Mega and then yeah. you got this first client um, about six months later. Sure. C can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, the growth of the business? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's, I was no, going to say no. the early days, but it is only the you early days. You mean from kind of signing a client so, off to... Yeah, I mean, I'm curious to know is, um, you know, I'll, a lot of times you, you talk to to successful businesses, and um, and you know on the outside it would seem like they started the business yeah. and it was smooth sailing. Yeah, they got yeah. all these clients, you know, and then sure. it exploded. Whereas yeah. you know when you dig a bit deeper, yeah. the first months or years were struggling. Yeah. You know, the, the founders don't even know if they're gonna yeah. you know be able to yeah. eat the next week, and you know yeah. it's gonna up and down, and yeah. it's a slower growth before it takes off. Absolutely. So I'm curious to know what's yeah, no, what's like for you. It's a really good question. I think you got to remember as well. That only kind of myself there at the time as well. So when yeah. you do sell in um, a big project like that, you've then got to actually execute. Yeah. So that, that kind of eats into your ability to be out selling, which would bring in new business. And I think particularly with the very first um, with the very first campaign, I, I then changed my focus um, to actually making that a massive success. So I can't remember how many how many sales calls I would have been doing back then, but they certainly dropped off as we looked to kind of do something for that, for that client that had never been done before. And uh, the, the site was built out as a permanent site even though we were only launching two vehicles. 
um, the, the actual media that we went across, it was the first campaign that ever went across all operator portals at the same time. We went across four Australian publishers, we went across four global ad networks. And this had never been done in Australia and, and to that point. And I think the key then was that we tracked every single media. So we were able to tell the client, you know, this particular mobile media cost you X amount per browser, this cost you this particular media was X amount per test drive. And I think we actually had 22 different URLs. So um, with, with four URLs per, per operator ad network. So for from January to March um, of, of 2010, my focus was basically on just that campaign. And making sure that it was it was something that had never been done before in the country. Um, so when you talk about your question's completely right. So then you know did did the money start pouring in once you got your first deal? Not at all. Um, but I think I think I think looking back in it, that campaign was the first mobile campaign to ever win an effectiveness award at Adma. And i have never been to an awards before. But I mean, I think the fact that a mobile campaign was recognised in the effectiveness category spoke for itself, that not only had mobile arrived, but it had arrived with a sufficient amount of ROI for it to be deemed effective. And I think that's the kind of the payback we got for that three months focus. And then once, once that was done, um, obviously the, the, the permanent site was built, the site ticks over, it gets its own traffic from, from mobile browsers that hit the web. We're then able to focus and kind of go, right, Who's the next client that will that will kind of tackle? So you're completely right in what you say. It's kind of this slow burning one. You just put all the effort into one client, you get them up, and then you've got to kind of get back your sales hat on and get back out there and get, and get another client and kind of go through that process again. And um, so so you couldn't be you, you're you're spot on basically. And um, I think the the thing in the back of my head, or, or the, the, the the thinking I had in the back of my head was that. If it takes a year and a half to build a brand, as in a mobile agency that does some really, really, really good work, and if it only, you know, if, if we're only executing one campaign with a major global brand every three months, well, at least that's four at the end of the year. And that's four case studies that we can take to market. So, so you're completely right, and really it's only, it's only in 2011 that we're seeing um, what, what, what you spoke about, where is kind of this, this massive uplift of, of kind of business really kicking. And uh, from our last conversation, yeah. uh, uh, actually, you clarified that with you, but you've taken on another salesperson now. Is it Absolutely, right? yeah. So yeah. You've, you've got that yeah. resources, they can go out and sell, you can deliver, Correct. And sort of the, yeah. the business can grow a whole lot more Absolutely, quickly. yeah. And I mean, that, I mean, when you go back to, the, to the, when you were asking me the questions about working on your own, that has been just incredibly rewarding. I mean, to, to have, to, I, I've, I've and I think for, for anyone starting up there, it's got to be one of the biggest lessons I learned as well. Is your you know your first salesperson is such a crucial crucial decision, and you need to get that right. Now I got lucky in that Rena had worked before with me in in in, a bit in the mobile business before, um, and it's it's just it's so so I knew what I, what I, I knew the risks weren't that high, um, and she, and she's just fantastic. I mean the passion is there for mobile. The so, so intelligent, but she. She's sales focused as well, so so you actually and what you actually find is you actually get more productivity out of yourself by having someone else there with you. It's 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 very interesting what happens. It's kind of um, you you you've got someone else there. You think well, I'd have to be responsible for someone else, so surely my productivity would go down. But it works the other way. It actually just inspires you to even kind of drive even even more. So if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that really cool to hear that. Um, in the early days, something we've spoken about before is sure. um, you hired a, a, a surf Corp virtual office. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm interested, I actually posted a, a, an article on our pitch yeah. yesterday about, about virtual office and yeah. I guess the value in that. Yeah. Um, can you explain that more? I gather Absolutely. it was a, a credibility thing. But yeah, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it was very important. It's, it's, it really is. Um, surf Corp was very important to me. Um, Surf Corp is a virtual office, which basically has a, handles the landline. So if someone calls True, that they'll either ask for, for one of the um, your your put True handles the fax number. Someone answers the phone there. They know about your business. They're able to talk. You've got um, the option to take up some office space every, every you know I don't know if it's three hours or four hours depending on every day or, or whatever. But the most important thing about Surf Corp was because um, we were looking to take on global brands. There is a perception issue there that you, you cannot be working from, from home. You, you cannot be working from your apartment or something like that. 
you need to have a good address in, 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 um, in, in wherever that might be. And I do believe that um, that was very, very important. It's, it can never be proven, but I, I, I think it's, it's only now that we're, we've moved into actual physical destination. And in fact, we still have the CERT Corp still running as we're, as we're also in, in, in physical de- destination. That was really, really important. Yeah, cool. And, and um, yeah, for sure, when, when you got that, when you're a startup and you're trying to get that yeah. credibility issue, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, when you're trying to get that credibility, yeah. saying, oh, I'm going back to my office now, or whatever you want to say, yeah. here's I the mean, address. It's not, it's not really, because it's never really, for, for me, it was never really about kind of, you know, you're not saying that you've got a big office space. I mean, you know, I don't, I, one of the best stories was, I think we were at level 57 at MLC Center, and I think it was, we were in, in a meeting or something like that, and um, the client said, level 57, the views must be great. I said, yeah, you can see, you can see for miles, like, the views are big, but my desk space isn't that big. <laughs> you know, and that, that's the kind of the, the thinking there. So it was never about pulling the wool over the eyes of the client. But you do not have a need for a physical space at that start of the business. Your job is to be out there talking to people, um, particularly in the business I was in. So it was an absolutely perfect fit, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool. Um, Okay, so, so just shifting focus for a moment. Um, look, it's something I've been thinking about a lot of late, about um, having a business that solves a big problem. Yeah. Um, even better, if it solves a big problem in an emerging market. Yeah. Now, um, in your case with, with Mobiseat, you've got both. You, you've got this, um, basically consumers are, are jumping on, yeah. on mobile. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, obviously that's increasing. It's this emerging market where suddenly um, yeah. you know, mobile's big now. And then you got this big problem where the the big brands aren't yet on mobile. Sure. They've got consumers coming to their websites, and that, you know they look crap basically. Yeah. So you've yeah. got this big problem, and you got the emerging market. You yeah. sort of got both. Sure. Um, uh, a, a quote I guess I've got from you sometime in the past is that less than four percent of the top five hundred companies in Australia have opened the mobile channel for their consumers. Yeah. You probably said that a whole lot of times. To, yeah. Well. To yeah. Yeah. I mean, it might be slightly higher than that, but I mean it's. You know, you know what it is, it, it's, that, it's that going to a, a major brand's website on a phone and yeah. having that experience, you just can't find what you want. Yeah. You know? I mean, the, the, the stats, are, especially with the amount of Android phones that are going to flood the market this year, I mean, the stats are always getting higher and higher, 50% of Australians have smartphones, but we're, we're looking at Androids on sale now for $130, can, can put an, an Australian kind of on the mobile web, you know? Um, the, 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 the numbers of, of actual, when you look at the actual num- the opportunity for these brands, apart from just kind of doing the hygiene of fixing that experience um, for, for, for all the, the, their consumers that are visiting their website, um, in terms of the mobile advertising, I know there's, there's, there's 2 billion impressions a month in Australia. So I know AdMob have, um, Google's AdMob have 1 billion impressions a month. This is mobile advertising. Um, and then the other eight or nine ad networks we work with will have at least that again. So you've got this massive appetite from consumers to kind of be in this space. You've got um, these major brands who, who just aren't doing it. And, and, and it's because, I suppose, education is, is kind of a, is, is a big one. Where, where do we start? How, how do we do it? There's also the kind of, the, well, let's test it. Let's just build out a two-page site rather than a kind of a permanent site. There was stuff released from PayPal then, um, I think it was recently, it said um, there's $150-$50 million um, spent via mobile commerce last year. Australia being the third country after Japan and Korea in terms of an appetite for mobile commerce. Mm. That to me, Japan and Korea have always been miles ahead of everyone else in terms of mobile. So to have Australia just sitting right behind them is, you know, it's, it's really, th- I really think it's time for these, for these for the major brands to really wake up and, and kind of and look at mobile because the consumers are, 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 are there in their drugs, you know? Well, uh, look, you, you've sold me on it. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I, I'm interested to hear when you got, in, when you got into it. Sure. Um, were, were you thinking, hey, this is a big opportunity, this is a big problem, I've got to get in there and solve it? And, and even in hindsight now, can you sort of look at that and go, hey, this is a great business to be in, compared to another, like, uh, I mean, you're probably not thinking about other yeah. businesses, but... If you look at another business and it's yeah. a small problem, it's like sure. that it's an old market or it's a mature market, yeah. 
Are you sort of just thinking, hey, lucky I'm in this business, it can, yeah. there's so much potential? Can you explain sort of more about that? Yeah, um, I remember I remember the kind of the first slide MobiSig did. We actually, I think, I think built it on the Mega program one night on, on a whiteboard, but it was kind of, it, it literally had, a, had, had the consumers there with, you know, the appetite for mobile, the brands here not, not joining them, and then kind of a list of, of the obstacles in, in place. So I always knew that was what we were fixing. I didn't re- expect it to move so quick. I didn't expect the consumers to accelerate to the point that they have at the speed that they have. And um, I, I, I thought it would be kind of a slower progression. There was more consumers than brands there in 2009, but they had just literally kind of shot, shot through the roof. I mean, um, iPhone launches was a big one, the Android phones flooding the market. So the di- I never expected it, the gap to become so big. So it's actually become a, a bigger gap since, since started the business than, than, than before. But I always knew that was that was the issue that we were attempting to kind of to fix. Cool, and, and obviously, um, uh, I think this is actually something we spoke about before the interview, but in yeah. terms of, um, I guess, your focus being not yeah. so much on competitors, but on, I guess, just, just selling your own business. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you're in this emerging market, and it's, I mean, it's almost like a land grab, or, or there's just so much yeah. growth potential, yeah. Yeah. In a way, there's enough. There's enough work Absolutely. for everyone. So yeah. You don't even need to think about the No, no. I mean, compared, but competitors in this space. I mean, I really mean this. I welcome, I welcome that. The more people that can be out there educating brands is fantastic. Um, there is, there's, there's not enough mobile companies in Australia for for the opportunity that's there. And um, I mean, our we've been very clear with our focus this year. We want to, we we want to get at least one client from a number of different verticals. Um, we want a client from, from the automotive, which we've kind of already done, um, entertainment and education, which, we, which we've done, um, finance and FMCG, which we're, we're working on, um, government client, um, telco client, handset manufacturer client, and uh, travel and, 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 of course, retail, which I think is, is been deliberately, I think in, in my headspace, we deliberately left retail till the end until we could get sufficient data to prove that mobile commerce is, is, is ready for that, for that particular client. So that's what Mobi6 focuses on for 2011. That's what we're kind of chipping away on and what we want to, to come in now before December 31st. Okay, um, on, on, on that there, is the, is the strategy that if you go and get an education mm-hmm. vertical uh, client and then you go get a, well, obviously you've got automotive and then you go get um, Retail or one of yeah. the other ones that you said. Once you get that, then you've sort of proven out the business across all yeah. these verticals, and then you can go get two or three or four. Each, each yeah, I think I think it actually comes from from a pretty good place. I think it actually challenges us as an agency to come up with a solution for a different vertical. And um, you would find that these guys, the, the, those particular verticals, are also the biggest spenders in the United States, which 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 leads this market. Um, but but really, this is driven more from a kind of a to be consistently challenging. We seek as an agency to find different solutions for different verticals. It would be easy to work with 10 car companies because we, we, we understand that process now and, and, and how to roll it out. It's much more challenging to take on a different vertical and to kind of try and you know, find a solution for that particular brand. So, so um, the challenging part though, I mean, yeah. is, it, is, it just, is that to keep it interesting for yourself or is it yeah. something more like you're trying to keep the, the cutting edge of technology, you're trying to be that innovator in this yeah. space? Like what, what's the log- I mean, what's the logic behind? I think, doing, doing I think the hard way or the challenging way. I think I think I look, there's probably a load of different benefits in, in, in that approach. I think it's um, I, 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 I think the main thing is is really the, the 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 value it will add to the agency to be able to actually do that for completely different verticals and to prove that we've kind of opened the mobile channel fully for for a government agency and also a retail client. I mean, they're two completely different solutions that will be required. So I think from, from a value of an agency, if we can hit that point by the end of the year and have done it for all those different verticals, that should position us as, as quite a smart mobile agency in Australia, I, I would think. Yeah, okay. Good strategy. Um, okay, so, so in terms of something else that, that's a little bit different um, to what we've been speaking about uh, thus far, um, there's a lot of startups that... that uh, I guess have have an advertising business model. So yeah. um, perhaps they launch they launch with something of of uh, 
something of value to consider, something of value to users, and they try and pick a big, uh, they try and build a big user base. Sure. But they don't have any other business model tied in, so yeah. they go, well, hey, we're going to do advertising. Yeah. Um, that that sort of you know that sort of thought. Yeah. So my, my I guess my view on where the advertising I guess space is going is that it's becoming much more trackable. It's becoming yeah. much more measurable. Yeah. And probably in five or ten years' time, or even less than that, yeah. there's no room for a a business to be in the, to have an advertising business model that isn't trackable or sure. measurable. Yeah. Um. Obviously, you're a leader in in the, yeah. the I guess ROI or the measurable advertising space of mobile. Yeah. Of, of mobile. Yeah. I mean. No doubt you got some views, I guess, in the importance of measurability Absolutely. and trackability. Yeah, and I think, what, like, what's your thoughts again, on? I think this comes from the experience I've had. I mean, if you if you even look back to the first the very first campaign we ran for on MobiSeek, you know, 22 URLs, that was that was unheard of back then. But we knew the importance of being able to track that. Um, it's very easy to, to kind of, well, it's not very easy, but it's, it's easier to kind of sell a little, a little mobile campaign to a brand it's much harder to basically open the mobile channel for a brand so that they continue to spend in mobile. And the one thing that you need to have in order to do that is, is, is tracking as much as possible as you can do. And that was always, that was always ingrained in me. So, so whenever we spend a client's money in mobile media, we are tracking the effectiveness of that to the point that if it doesn't work, the client is made aware of that and there will not be a spend in, in the future if it hasn't, if it hasn't worked, if that makes sense, yeah? Yeah, so, so I'm just trying to, I mean, obviously you're the advertising agency, but I guess I'm thinking of a startup that, that isn't the advertising agency, yeah. they've just got an advertising business model, and just trying yeah. to relate what you said there yeah. is, maybe someone's building an iPhone app, yeah. and um, you know, they're, they're, one, their, their model is that they're gonna put in little uh, ads that are relevant to whatever the content sure. is yeah. in, in their app. And, yeah. that, and that's going to be their, their revenue stream. Yeah. So, oh, what you saying is what you're saying there is that that there needs to be trackable, so that they can go to their customers who are the advertisers and say, "Hey, three hundred people have clicked on this, and this is where it yeah. went through, and this is what they bought, or you know yeah. that sort of thing." Is that where you see that going? I would think so. Yeah, because um, you know, for for too long, uh, the, the mobile industry has been about brands running campaigns, and it's kind of listen, we got we got ten thousand clicks. It's kind of like, was, was that good? Was that hard? Or what is that? Um, so I understand, I understand the question. So I think for, for anyone in, in the instance that you're doing, it's, it makes sense to put as much tracking as possible across, across that app. Because you need to be able to go back to that person who spent money on your app and say, listen, this is what happened. This is the results you got. This is the ROI you got. Do you want to spend more money? Because if you don't have that there, how are you going to persuade that brand to continue to invest on, on your app? Yeah, you know, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's crucial, it really is. And I think mobile more than anything, because it's, it's such a new medium, and that the, the, the tracking is just so important, it really is so important. Okay, great. Um, one of the, I think it was, a, I mean, I've got two questions here, so we'll go through right, them. Okay. But one of them is that around mistakes you've learned, the other one's lessons. I, I think yeah. you mentioned something before, but I can't remember what it was. So let's just get the, I guess, mistakes that you've yeah. made um, mm -hmm. along the way. Sure. Um, you know, we, it wasn't all smooth sailing. No, no, no. no, no this is going well, but, yeah. you know, what mistakes did you make and, and I guess, what, you know, what did you learn from that? Look, I think, I think early on I didn't have processes in place correctly. Um, it was all more of a focus of just kind of a whirlwind and, and, and get out there and sell. Um, so I had to tighten up processes very, very, very quickly. Um, there was, there was in, in, in terms of, of, of the stack, I kind of said I, I focused on, on competitors a little bit too much early on. Um, I, well, what, else, what else would have happened? Um, there's been a lot of mistakes, Gareth, I can assure you that. Uh, you tend to kind of just move on, I suppose, when, when you make them. I'm trying to think of some classics for you. Um, I think... I think did you yeah. make any which cost you a lot of money or you lost clients or something like no, that? No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I mean, there's definitely been some spends that have been, you know, you kind of go, what did I spend on that? But then as well, we've often spent money on things that we didn't know would work that have given us great results back as well. So there's, there's been that kind of a, an experimental spend on, on, on different things. Um, but yeah, it's funny because I'm sure there's loads of... 
So, okay, so for the two that you mentioned was um, yeah. getting better processes. Yeah. Um, and, and the other one was um, about focus and yeah. competitors. So just, just delving into each of those a little bit more. Yeah. What are the sort of processes that you didn't have in place from the sure. start that you needed to fix? Um, there was there was a lot that we needed to tighten up on. There was um, there was the, the, the just 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 general. What what we needed to make sure was that, and we really learned this with as, as Rhea came into the business was that, um, we needed processes in place so that somebody could come into the business and simply be given a manual and, and take over, if if that makes sense. So that if if I was not dead by the bus, someone could still kind of make the business run, if that makes sense. Yeah. That was businesses across everything. From the processes at our end for, for, for building sites, the processes at our end for purchasing media, for doing mobile search, for dealing with the mobile affiliates, all those different processes we needed to kind of tighten down to make sure that there was, could be continuity as, as new people came into the business and it wasn't all kind of kept up in, in my head as such. Did you find that once you actually spent the time to, I guess, document the processes, yeah. you could also look at what you've been doing and go, you know, why the hell have I been doing it that way? Absolutely. When, when yes. this, you know, this is yeah. obviously a way better way of doing absolutely. it. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, without a doubt, I mean, the, the, the benefits for actually, literally, as you say, writing it down, you'd say, okay, right, why wasn't it done that way? I think as well there has to be some understanding, though, of, 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 of the amounts that would have been going on at that time to kind of pull off the campaigns in time and get them out the door in time as a, as a kind of a, just, just on yourself. So... Um, there was definitely the, the there was definitely a, a, yeah there was definitely a lot of things highlighted. I think one of the other things I learned was as well the um, the ability to switch off. So this is very very important. I think any, anyone starting up should should really kind of um, think about this one. But f for the first six to nine months, I found it very very difficult to switch off. So an incredible focus on kind of getting to getting you know a brand on board or a second brand on board or, or whatever it might be. Um, it, it, it can almost consume you so it can almost kind of run with you from a Friday to a Saturday to all, all the way through all week and, um, and I had to be very careful of that because there's also the danger of burnout especially in the first 12 months so I mean what I did differently was you know we, we kind of did, um, joined up to, to a boot camp three times a week and made sure you got a game of golf or just found different ways of kind of switching off if that makes sense but definitely in the early days that was something I wasn't doing and it's probably driven a little bit by the nerves of, um, am I doing the right thing, if, if that makes sense. So it's very important for anyone that's starting up that you must have a switch off button to kind of refresh so you can come back in and kind of and go again, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a thought that popped in my head. I forgot that there's, yeah. a, there's a, a term that people use for it, but it's something like um, shower thoughts or something like that. Yeah, but yeah. It's yeah, basically yeah. Like, yeah. When, it, when you're in the shower yeah. <laughs> and your mind just wanders, yeah. if you sort of actually stop and realise, hey, what am I thinking about? Yeah. Um, that's sort of the, the, when you realise what it is, yeah. that's the core issue that's, that, that's, that you're involved in at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So I gather for you, you know, without, without thinking about it too much, sure. that probably was that for nine months. It's yeah, literally absolutely. You're just constantly business, yeah. business, 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 focus, focus, kind of focus, and, and yeah, and then, um, and it's, it's actually much more rewarding when you learn to be able to switch that off. It's much more rewarding, you're, you're more productive, I think you're more relaxed, and, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely one of the mistakes I made early on. What, what, sort of, um, what, what sort of hours were you working in the early days, um, even compared to now? And just, just to yeah. preface this for a moment, yeah. when you're talking about not switching off, it's, yeah. not, it's not even as though you're, and I know that from my yeah, experience, yeah. it's not even as though you're, you're really working, it's just you know, you're on the bus, you're making dinner, you're just doing yeah. everything and it's just in your head. Absolutely. So obviously yeah. you need to be able to switch that off then, yeah. but obviously you still need to have significant hours where you're actually working, sure. doing effective work in the business. So sure. that, what sort of hours were you working in? What oh, was that I, I mean, I, honestly, I think um, you could have been getting up at eight and, and doing, you know, doing a lot of selling and then back reading and then it, it could have got up to 16 hours a day at some stages, definitely. It, it could have got up. Um, and, 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 and again, back to the advisor, he also had, a, a, Roger also had a lot of advice to do around that. Um, and I think if he saw any kind of concerns that I was getting out t too much or even approaching burnout, he was able to kind of step in and say, listen, just that objective view of, listen, this is how well you're doing. You've got this, you've got this, you've got this. So, yeah, that was probably the biggest mistake. And that's, uh, yeah, okay. I need cool. to find those outlets. 
Uh, what about, um, is there anything else that you've, you've learnt um, along the way that, um, and it's something you mentioned before, is like it's yeah. around the, your first hire, um, and obviously this, the, yeah. this, this sales uh, lady that, that's working for you now sounds yeah. like it's a great hire, but do you have any thoughts, I guess, around you know, lessons like that or, yeah. or something else that we haven't discussed? Yeah, I think, again, and some of this might just be relevant for, for the vertical that we're in, but um, we've got very, very lucky with the actual clients that we work for. Um, I mean, the, they, they've given us, I suppose, the reins to be innovative, the, the reins to take risks in mobile, like reasonable risks. And every mobile site that we build will have something new on it. And it could, it could be a YouTube video that we haven't done before. It could be a review of a, of a product or it could be, could be anything. It doesn't necessarily mean that that particular element of the site will actually drive a lot of traffic. But what, what it does is, is, is that it allows us to kind of see if it does that makes sense and if it, if it doesn't it can come off um, and, and we've just recently launched a, a second phase for about a phone which is m.photofoundirect.com.au and that's with their, their direct to you team Fanola Power, Kieran Wogan and Scott Lewis the head of, of um, online and direct and these are really marketers at the very very top of their game but the, it's very important for us as a mobile agency to, to be working with marketers who are that innovative and who are constantly kind of pushing us to, to do, to do um, innovative things and, and really w where that's coming from is in the past I would have worked with clients who possibly weren't like that um, and, 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 and it, it can be quite challenging when you don't, when you bring new ideas to your clients and, and they're not that receptive to them if, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, it, it certainly does and I guess I'm thinking about it, I mean it certainly it makes sense in your, in your industry but from a I guess more general lesson, yeah. um, it's something I've been uh, I guess I'm actually some content for a how to start up workshop soon but one of the things I've been working on around is just I guess good and bad customers and, and try and get great customers that um, you know I guess add a lot of value to your business and yeah. such yeah. Um, it sounds like for example yeah. for you those great customers are innovative yeah. customers who are prepared to take on a little bit of risk or try yeah. and get innovative with their marketing yes so, so, absolutely yeah. um, have you, so I guess the question to you is, have you then gone out and sort of said, hey, these are the sort of customers I want, I'm specifically looking for those guys? In a way, um, it's a good question. I think in a way, we're just more attracted to them, if that makes sense. I mean, it's only now that I'm realizing it as a kind of a conscious conscious thing, but I think we're definitely very, um, I think it'd be fair to say all, all of, you know, the, all of the MobiC customers are certainly very innovative in terms of testing and trying new things. You have to be with this channel. In the past, I may have had customers who, who weren't um, to that degree innovative in, in previous jobs, about across the board, you know. So that's that's been a very very big um, learning to me as well. Is is that, um, the, 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 I suppose, the synergy between um, Mobiseek and the customer is is, is is very very important. Cool. Um, okay, so so just finishing off here. Um, look, moving forward from Mobiseek, obviously you talked about the rest of this year. Is you trying to hit this? These targets of getting on, yeah. um, it sounds like five or six other new verticals. Yeah. Um, what, what's and, and that was great to explain that. What What's the, the focus after that? Is it maybe that's too far ahead to think sure. about in, in such an early, yeah. you know, an early business? But do you have any view on on next year and, and after yeah. where, the, where you're going to take it? I mean, I, I think I think if we hit that first of all, I mean the the interesting thing is that we we tend to use a lot of um, global ad networks. As opposed to, it's just, it's just it's just the nature of the clients we go after. But what's what's very interesting about this business is because we use global ad networks, we can simply um, we can take a client from Australia to to somewhere else to, to another country if that, if that makes sense. Because you simply choose a different country on, on a global ad network. So I think as we come towards the end of the year, I would be looking to kind of move the business um, certainly into New Zealand, possibly kind of Singapore. Um, and Asia, I would, I would like to see some kind of movement in, into those spaces. That would be kind of my 2012 project. But, um, but right now, what, what we need to do is just focus on getting those, those verticals kind of full signed off. Good to hear you folks do that, and, uh, and, and good luck with it all. all so right. thanks a lot for the interview. Thanks very much, Gavin. Cheers. Cool. Thank you. That was the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any feedback or recommendations of people who I should be interviewing, please let me know, I do want to hear about it. Get in contact with me via the iPitch website, uh, that's the best way. 
and otherwise look out for more interviews at ipitch.com.au. Thank you.